Good morning. Does everyone have an agenda? Okay, because there are agendas pa being passed around and also if you have not signed in, there's a sign-in sheet for the district managers as well as for the agencies in the back, at the back table. So my name is Tanya Cantlow-Cockfield. I am the assistant counsel to the borough president, and I'd like to welcome you to the April 24th Borough Service Cabinet meeting. At this time, I'd like to call the roll. Starting with the district managers. <clears throat> Gerald Esposito. Present. Robert Paris. Henry Butler. Present. Celestina Leon. Present. Melinda Perkins. Jeremy Laffer. Michelle George. Josephine Beckman. Marnie Elias Pavia. Barry Spitzer. Eddie Mark. Present. Sean Elise Campbell. Laura Singer. Here. Viola Green Walker. Here. Sharif Frazier. Dorothy Tirano. Next, I'll start with the agencies. 311. Administration for Children's Services. Brooklyn Public Library. Here. Commission on Human Rights. Con Ed. Here. Department for the Aging. Department of Buildings, Here. Department of City Planning, Here. Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, Here. Department of Com Consumer Affairs, Here. Department of Corrections, Here. Department of Developmental Disabilities, Here. Department of Design and Construction, Department of Environmental Protection. Here. Department of Finance. Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Department of Homeless Services. Department of Housing, Preservation and Development. Department of In Information Technology and Telecommunications. Department of Parks and Recreation. Here. Department of Probation. Department of Sanitation. Department of Transportation. Present. Department of Youth and Com Community Development. Here. Fire Department. Here. Human Resource Administration. The Mayor's Office. National Grid. Here. NYCHA. New York City Transit. Office of Emergency Management. Police Department. Small Business Services. Yeah. U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, U.S. Postal Service, and Verizon. Okay. Okay. So
So we have four presentations today. Today we're going to start, uh, we're going to change the order of the agenda. We'll start with New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, Mikkel Adgate will be our first presenter. Um, my name is Mikkel Abgate. I am a senior advisor in the Bureau of Public Affairs at DEP. I think I have met many of you over the years in my time at DEP when I first started in the Green Infrastructure Group and I would come and talk about rain gardens and stormwater management. Um, I'm talking today about a plan that we recently released in regards to stormwater management and pollution control in um, New York City's waterways. So. Just to um, sort of set the stage for the area that we're talking about, I know a lot of times we come and we talk about combined sewer overflows. Those are the um, discharges of sometimes raw sewage and stormwater that happen in this type of sewer system, where there's one pipe that goes to the wastewater treatment plant that conveys stormwater and wastewater to our wastewater treatment plants for treatment. And then depending on the severity or intensity of a rainstorm, you might have a discharge or a combined sewer overflow. So obviously we've invested a tremendous amount of money. We have our long-term control plans for Gowanus Canal, Newtown Creek, other water bodies to address combined sewer overflows. But the plan that we just came out with a few weeks ago is uh, specifically for pollution that's caused in the other parts of the city that are served by what we call the separate sewer system. So the way to think of this is that there's two pipes in the street. One that's taking sanitary waste from our homes and our buildings to the wastewater treatment plant for treatment. And the other that's taking stormwater runoff directly to the local water hole to discharge. Um, the water that comes out here is, is generally cleaner than what you would see in the combined sewer overflow because there's no raw sewage, but it is still picking up pollutants from our streets, our sidewalks, our rooftops. Um, and so this entire plan is focused on how do we reduce pollutants in stormwater runoff so that we're improving water quality in all of our waterways. Um, to set the stage a little bit, you know, may know that uh, DEP and the city are regulated under the Clean Water Act by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, or DEC. Uh, just about three years ago, they issued a permit, uh, what we call an MS4 permit, that required us to develop this stormwater management plan, an entire program and array of activities um, again, to reduce pollution and stormwater runoff. So we've been working on the development of this plan since August 2015, and I've come out and briefed at this meeting, have had a lot of meetings in CB13 and other areas, specifically about the, the development of the plan. Um, again, even though this permit was issued to the entire city of New York, it specifically focuses on the areas served by the MS4. So that's everything that's shown in blue. The predominantly Staten Island, portions of Southeast Queens, a little bit in the Bronx, and these areas of Brooklyn. And there's almost no MS4 area in Manhattan. The way to think of it is that the older parts of the city were designed with that combined system and sort of the younger or newer newly developed areas like Staten Island or Southeast Queens have the separate new sewer areas. So everything that we're talking about in regards to this plan only pertains to the areas in blue. And so for Brooklyn, that means um, CB13, CB18, 15, right along here, along sort of Jamaica Bay, Coney Island Creek. And all of the programs that we'll be implementing under the plan fit into the variety of other programs that we have in place to improve water quality in these water bodies. Um, so in terms of how this plan has been developed, I mentioned that the permit was issued to the city in, in 2015. It is a, a program that's interesting because it doesn't just impact DEP, it impacts all of our city agencies. So there's been a tremendous amount of interagency coordination, coordination with the state, 
We've had a ton of public meetings. Um, and since last summer, we've been developing the plan. And we actually have some handouts that we'll leave at the back that sort of describes more detail about the MS4 program. Um, earlier this month, we released a draft of the plan, which is now available for public comment and for public review. Um, and comments will be due on May 15th. So the plan itself is extremely comprehensive. It's about 400 pages. So I'm sure you'll all go home and read it tonight. But um, we do have an executive summary that summarizes each of the chapters. And the way that, to think about each of these chapters is each one represents a holistic set of programs specifically to that area. The reality is that many of these things have been happening either that DEP has been doing or other city agencies have been doing, but this really integrates all of the work in a comprehensive way to explain how we're going to reduce these types of pollutants. Um, so the areas that have sort of either new initiatives, new efforts, are the ones that are in blue. So for instance, there will be new programs for construction activities in the MS4 area. The idea being that if you are disturbing an acre or more of soil where you are going to have um, you know, any type of fluids, pollutants, um, soil, rock, whatever, what have you, um, if it's raining on your construction site and there are drains there, anything that you have that's not covered is going to go directly into the drain and discharge directly into the local water body. So this is new activities for construction, um, new programs for what we call pollution prevention and good housekeeping. That means every city agency that owns property in an MS4 area has new requirements for controlling stormwater on their property. So that means if there is a bus depot that's washing school buses, there's new requirements for what types of materials they're using, how they're storing it, so that when they're washing their buses, whatever type of chemicals or cleansing fluid that they're using isn't going directly into the harbor. And so if you were to look through the executive summary or our other materials, there's a lot more detail about each each and every one of these initiatives. I just want to highlight how much public participation we've had throughout the development of this plan. Try not to look at Eddie because I practically moved to Coney Island last year um, between the number of workshops that we've had with environmental stakeholders and other community leaders. Um, we know that water quality improvements is a, a really big issue for a lot of our neighborhoods. We know communities are returning to the waterfront more frequently for recreation, for fishing, and other activities. And so it's really important that folks tell us what types of initiatives they value and that we incorporate their feedback. Um, so we've had over 50 stakeholder meetings since 2015. We've had hundreds of comments that have come in on earlier documents that we've released. Um, and we're expecting a really robust comment period now that the plan is available. Um, so just to highlight the meetings that we're having about the draft plan itself, um, we've been going to all of the borough service cabinets. We're going to have two what we call general public meetings. One is tonight in Manhattan. The next one is next week in Staten Island, um, where folks will come and we have uh, sort of the longer version of this presentation where we actually go through each and every single one of those chapters and highlight what does the permit require, what is the state requiring us to do, how have we developed the program to respond to the state's requirements, and then what are the measurable goals to track our success for the future. Um, so things like water quality monitoring so we can actually see if our various initiatives are successful. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, if you're interested in having us come out to talk to um, either your environmental protection committee or your community board, we're happy to do that. Um, more information is available on our website and I said we'll leave handouts for your review. But in terms of the public comment period, those comments are due back to us by May 15th. Um, at that point, we'll review the comments, we'll prepare a response to comments, and then we submit the final draft plan to the state in August for their final review and approval. 
And then once that document is approved, that sets the stage for actually implementing the initiatives over the next several years. Any questions? Will you have a general public meeting in Brooklyn? Because I saw listings in other boroughs. Yeah, right now we've only planned to have one in Manhattan and in Staten Island, though we've shared all of that information with the community boards and the groups that have participated. I mean, I guess why are you picking just two places? Um, it was based on having more central locations. Given that the um, MS4 area in Brooklyn is here, and we have done a lot of meetings in CB13 and CB15, we thought that having a sort of citywide location would be helpful. And then since Staten Island is the largest MS4 area, that's why we scheduled that meeting. There. I mean, would you be interested in having Surely. Okay. I think if, um, if the communi community boards felt like there was an audience that wouldn't be interested or able to come out to Manhattan or Staten Island, we'd be happy to come out and, and host another meeting. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Our next presenter is Andrew Kalish from Localize. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Andrew Kalish. Uh, some of you might remember me. I used to work at the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Hi Marty. <laughs> um, for four years, so uh, very comfortable in this neighborhood. I live in this neighborhood. Um, and I wanted to talk today about this new company I'm working with called Localize. We're a real estate technology startup. I use the real, word real estate loosely uh, because it's not our main focus, but it's what we're classified as. Um, and what we're trying to do, or what we are doing, is tell the story of every single home in New York City and zip code and neighborhood. We feel that there's a lot of information you can get out there about what it's like to live somewhere, but you have to spend a lot of time to go out and do it. There's no one centralized location where you can understand what it's like to live somewhere today and the changes to come tomorrow. So I'm gonna explain how that works. We're an Israeli-based company. Uh, we started in Israel about five years ago and we launched officially in New York last week. It's a free product and it will always be free for the public. That is not our business model. Um, so we wanna ask, answer this question, what's going on around me? And what will it be like in the future? So there's this shared experience, right? Loudest block in NYC, I moved here and I had no idea that at two o'clock in the morning, this was the main route for garbage trucks, or there was eight restaurants and they were all doing their commercial drop off at the same time. You didn't know that unless you lived there. And a lot of time people who live there are complaining about it, but they don't have the data on it to really do anything about it other than call 311 over and over again. So my commute is a nightmare, right? The MTA right now, <laughs> We just heard, right, the MTA is not going to do a massive uh, renovation on a lot of these stations that people were expecting and planning their futures around, and every day it seems to be different. But where do you know? You only know when you get to the station and you see that little white um, flyer or a red piece of tape put across the entrance. You're like, why is the station closed? And you have to go on five different websites to figure it out. And with the demise of DMA, DNA info, it's even harder to find out some of that information. So this is a common problem facing all New Yorkers about whether you want to move to a new home or live in your current home. You just don't really know what's always going on around you and what the changes are to come. So we tried to solve that. So how do we do that? I'm going to take you through the product really quickly. And if this doesn't work, here we go. So this is 180 West Street. This is, this is a video. I didn't make this up. This is actually in the product. So this is in Brooklyn. Um, and you can see we have these different insights that pop up. So this insight tells you about whether or not your view is going to go away. It's doing a calculation based on what the FAR is around you, based on what you're looking at now. It tells you all the new construction that's coming, not just what's happening, but actually breaking down how many units are going to be built around you. What are their nuisances? Are, is there contamination in the area, Newton Creek, different lots? Which lots are contaminated based on DEP standards? All different things that are happening around you. This is an address in Queens, sorry. <laughs> So, right, more, so these are about schools. Not only schools that are there now, but what schools are coming and 
based on the development in the neighborhood, are those schools going to actually be sufficient for the neighborhood? This is something we had dealt with a lot of downtown Brooklyn, right? New rezonings that are going to occur are being thought to occur. Is a dog friendly place to live? What are the dog's names in the neighborhood? Are there parking complaints and what are they? Is it that you know, we have overzealous enforcement or is it that people are blocking curb cuts in people's private driveways? What is the standard here? And what is the sun like? Is it shady? Is it sunny? Is it a, is it a dark neighborhood? Is it a sunny neighborhood? So how do we do this, right? Because this is in real time. And this isn't just aggregating all that incredible data that the city is now putting out there. We're taking that data, right? <coughs> all different types of data. We're taking the, the, the incredible data the city's putting out and the city agencies are doing an incredible job because without them we wouldn't exist. But we're going beyond that. We're looking at commercial data. We're buying data from different companies. We're, we're working with Visa because we also know that census data isn't always correct. So we're trying to overlay consumer spending patterns on top of census data. So we're trying to provide this complete picture. And we're not just aggregating it and then regurgitating in some pretty data visualization. We actually have a team of urban planners that go through and work with our data scientists to look at this baseline of data and then create these insights on top of it. And how we do all of that is through this artificial intelligent machine. I know it's a little jargony, sorry. But essentially, the urban planners and the data scientists are going through this data, making inferences, and then, tr and then training this machine to be able to spit this out better and faster and more accurately. So we're able to really give you the sense of what it's going to be like at every single address. So people love it. It's been a huge success so far. We're seeing our users go through the roof because it's free. Everyone should be checking out their address to see what's happening. But the real key thing for this is what we can do and who the team is that built this. The team that built this is incredibly strong. So the Israeli team, all of our tech is based in Israel. So a company called Taboola, which is the world's largest programmatic ad network and insight engine. Trustier, which is the number one banking encryption software. Waze, we all know Waze. Our head designer who designed our entire product built all of Waze's map. And our president of the United States headed up brand strategy for Twitter um, in Asia Pacific. And in New York, we have myself, who knows these communities well and understands New York well. And also, we hired Amy Zimmer, a former head of real estate reporting at DNA Info. And what she's doing right now is looking at citywide data to try and surface different stories, things that we might be missing, and also then send those to the community board, send those to the elected officials, say, hey, look, there's something going on here that we might be missing because no one's looking at the data in this way. Right? We're looking at it as a whole. We're not really digging down and trying to figure out all different things because every city agency is overtaxed and you have a million, million things to do. So, and eventually we're going to be creating local news. She's going to build out a whole local news team that is going to be looking at this data and basing the reporting on what's going on in the neighborhood based on the data. So we have 100 staff in New York City and Tel Aviv. We have 10 in New York. The rest are in Tel Aviv and we're growing very quickly. Like I said, we have an incredible group. And I think the real secret sauce here, again, is we hire urban planners. So we're not just a machine that regurgitates open data. We actually review that data. We base assumptions on that data, and then we make inferences. So for example, those schools in Queens. Oh, there's these three new schools coming. But based on the pipeline of development projects, there's not going to be enough school seats for this neighborhood if the, the, the school construction authority's um, calculations stay true. So that's what we're trying to do. So we're trying to give people and make them more informed as citizens and make them more informed as home searchers as well. So what can we do? Um, you know, we are a for-profit company, but we think that there's a really incredible civic opportunity here as well. Um, we already are working with the Borough President's Office on a few, a very, some very cool initiatives. We're working with several bids. Um, we're working with a few other elected officials, and we already started to talk to several community boards about how we could help them, but also how could they help us? Because we want the information in this product to reflect the, the conversation that's happening in the community. So we don't want it to just be seen like, oh, it's some person in an office in Midtown talking about you know, some community board in Coney Island, for example. We want to talk to the people in Coney Island to make sure, one, we got it right, but two, that we're conveying the proper message. Right? So if there is a controversy, we want to be able to explain both sides accurately because we're trying to be Switzerland here. We're trying to be the truth, not the opinion. That's what we're attempting to do. We all know that's very hard in New York City. So there's a lot of different things we can do. Um, we're relying on different agencies already to pull information from them. Um, we started to reach out to several agencies, uh, especially their press offices, to get up-to-date imagery, up-to-date information, 
um, up-to-date press releases so they know not to just post it but send it to us directly so we can put it in the product immediately because consumers are using this every day and journalists are already calling us based on what they're seeing in the product. So consider another outlet for your agency to get the word out and get the message out. Um, site integration. We're building a free widget. So essentially you could get information on any address or a neighborhood or a zip code or a community board or a bid or any kind of outlined area. We'll provide that for free and we'll work with you to provide the insights you're looking for. Some insights you're not going to want, things about pricing or things that are a little bit more real estate driven, but things about transportation, things about education, things about nuisances, stormwater, all of that stuff, the, uh, environmental issues, those are the things you might want. And then the other third thing is trends and reports. You know, we're already talking to the borough president's office about how can we be a, a data analysis arm for his shop, right? If he says, okay, we, I'm seeing this problem from the community, I don't have the staffing power to go out and really parse through the data. Can you guys do that for me? Yeah, we're more than happy to. We're more than happy to look in the data and see if there's anything in the data that's there, but then also be correlating that to other types of data. So things that, might, that we might be missing because we're only looking at one data set. And that's our real secret sauce, comparing multiple data sets and then assigning them to one address. So it's a great product. It's live, it's free, it's mobile only right now. You don't have to download an app. It's www.localize.city. Play with it, yell at me if I got anything wrong, that's my email. We have, we have nine urban planners in New York City um, and several of them have, been in this, have spoken to several community boards already. We wanna talk to more, we wanna talk to more city agencies. So you know, please feel free to reach out. I'm gonna be here, grab me after. We wanna talk to everybody um, because we wanna make this right and we, we really see an opportunity to help out the people of New York because right now there's all this great data but the data is not designed for them. The data is designed for people to go, like us, and take advantage of it and build things on top of it and visualize it. There's no one place you can find all this information that we have in an easily accessible format. It just doesn't exist. So we want that to be kind of a tool for the citizens of New York and also for city government to make it a lot easier to access this data. So that's what I got. Feel free to ask any questions. And uh, yeah, ask away. Does anyone have any questions? Please. Yes. How do you make your money through advertising? So right now, um, we're venture-backed. <laughs> so we've raised a Series A, um, $11 million, all based on Israel. We're planning to raise a Series B. Our thought process regarding mo long-term monetization is uh, sort of three areas. One is there's a lot of space within the real, in the real estate market, because if we can make it easier for someone to find a home, um, there is value there, both on the brokerage side, bro both on the developer side, because if a, if a home buyer can find out all this great information about a neighborhood and then look at the apartments instead of the other way around. Right now you get served up with apartments and you have to do all the research yourself. We can give a broker or developer, we can send someone who's looking for an apartment two apartments instead of 10. And that saves everyone a lot of time and there's value there that can be extracted probably more on the brokerage or the development side. There is definitely an advertising opportunity, a very hyper local advertising opportunity. We're very, very, very careful about our data. We don't really wanna know who you are we only want to know that address and what you're interested in based on what you're looking at. We don't want to know, you know that you posted this picture or that you're in this group. We don't care about any of that. And we don't sell the data. We don't ever share it. We have no desire to have a company come and do some API and look at all and look at different user profiles. But that's not what we're ever going to do. And we also take ownership of all of our content because we write it ourselves. We're not like some of these other social networks that's like, oh, we don't take responsibility because it's the users. We're just the platform. No, 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 we write every word on this thing. So we own this content, we take, we take responsibility for it. And the third is also, you know, we've, we found in the real estate industry that there's a, a need for better research. Um, right now there's only a few companies that provide really deep dive research for the real estate industry. And uh, we think that there might be an opportunity there as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Question, any other questions? That's it? I get off that easy? I did have one. Please. So is the data, is it updated in real time? It's in real time. Real time. So if a new um, building permit is issued, it's issu it, we see it. If uh, DEP is going to start doing some construction about some stormwater mitigation, that pops up. We'll even update it from these meetings. When, when minutes of these meetings get posted, we look at those minutes and then update the product. So w for example, when the, the MTA announced that they were not going through the, the station modernization effort. That morning, we updated all those stations mm -hmm. in real time that were not going to be, because we've been telling people that, oh, your commute's gonna be affected. And now we said, oh wait, just kidding, it's not. Right. Maybe in 2020. So 
you know, we, we have library hours on there. <laughs> we have everything. So uh, the more we can get, the better, and we find that the more we put on there, the, the more people use it. Are you working with the mayor's office with the open data? We, we, we use it. Um, okay. In fact, I had to postpone a call with Jeffrey Goldberg, the deputy okay. CTO. Mm -hmm. um, he, I was supposed to speak with him after this meeting, but so I'm speaking with him a little later this week. Okay. Um, to really, to, they, they didn't know we existed, and we showed it to them, and they're like, whoa. Okay. So um, you know, we, we want to work with all city agencies. We're really excited to, and non-city agencies. <laughs> okay, cool. Yes? Is it out No, um, we're not sure yet, because we don't want to create any barrier for someone to use it. And you know, if you look at the top five apps in the App Store, they're owned by companies like Google and Facebook, and I don't really want to compete with them. <laughs> uh, but we think that if users, if we see a user demand for it, we'll do that. But right now, it works extremely well um, as a web app. And uh, you, know, you can save it onto your phone if you want to as a web app, but right now, we don't, users have not been asking for that. Um, but once there are more features, we're, uh, you know, eventually, but we'll see. Any other questions? All right. Thank you all so much. Appreciate your time. And again, Andrew, doc, Andrew K at localize.city. It's live, www.localize.city. Have fun with it. And send us feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much. So our next presenter is from the Brooklyn Public Library. We have Brenda Bent Peters, Supervisor of Outreach Services, and Michael Fianni, Director of Community Engagement. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having us today. Um, my name is Brenda Bent Peters. I'm the supervisor for Outreach Services, and this is my colleague here, Ava Razor, who's the director of the department. So um, we just wanted to, I know many of you thinking, well, I know what the library does, right? So uh, we just wanted to kind of update you on some of the development that we have been doing at the library. and. Um, and we've started this department, Outreach Services, about almost five years now, but a lot of people still don't know about a lot of the services that we provide. So today, we're trying to open that up so that you could understand more of what we do at the library. Yeah. So I'll let you know. Thank you. I'm not Michael Feeney, obviously. <laughs> um, Good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing in the Outreach Services Department at the library. Um, in Outreach Services, we work with all 60 um, libraries across Brooklyn, and um, we are particularly focused on connecting people who are marginalized or may have more barriers to accessing services. Um, so for example, in your um, community board meetings, do you, do you have questions from older adults who are looking for recreational activities, or what do you hear from older adults? What do you hear from older adults? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the senior centers, you work with the senior centers. One of the things, um, we have a, um, actually the oldest part of our department is our services for older adults. Um, we have books by mail, so homebound um, seniors or anyone who's homebound um, is able to call the library and have books sent to their home for free. Um, we have a lot of educational opportunities also for people who are homebound who can call in by phone or even um, by video to participate in classes. We have um, book discussions and we work with Durot University Without Walls. Um, we also, when we talk about senior centers, we work with 142 senior centers, nursing homes, um, and day programs, and deliver small collections. So we have little libraries all over Brooklyn. Um, Outpost libraries is one of the main things that we do. So we have um, books in senior centers. We have a book cart service that takes books out to Rikers Island, the Brooklyn House of Detention, and the Metropolitan Detention Center. All of our books, you, um, book um, delivery and book services usually are paired with programming. So for example, um, in 17 homeless shelters, family shelters around Brooklyn, we have outpost libraries where we have collections of books for adults and children, and we also do family programming, story times, pajama parties, 
um, workforce development. Brenda right now is working, um, doing a podcasting club, um, learning about technology at the um, Kensington Shelter. Um, so we try to bring literacy to the people of Brooklyn, but we also try to connect it to other um, skills and to um, community building. Um, a couple of other things we wanted to tell you about is how we um, connect families. Uh, so in 12 libraries around Brooklyn, uh, families can come into the library and visit with a family member who's incarcerated. So a child um, can um, go into a library room and a screen turns on and their dad pops up on the screen and they can have an hour together to talk and play and read books together. Um, our, we just surpassed 2,000 visits since the program launched two years ago. It's um, by appointment. Uh, there's not a limit. People, some people visit once a week. There's an older, um, there's a woman in South Brooklyn who visits with her teenage son every week. Uh, so we also, we see ourselves as using literacy to bring, to um, keep a bond between families. Another way that we do that is through a multi cultural family programming. So um, this, this week is actually our diversity in action week. It's um, also celebrated in a lot of parts of Latin America as the day of the child. Um, so we are having programs in almost 30 libraries just this week. I have a flyer for all of you um, in languages other than English. Um, so we really try to create cultural programs and story times that are in the languages spoken by the people of Brooklyn. Um, and we offer um, performances by folk artists. We offer um, sing-alongs, authors, and also just times for families to get together and share their traditions. Um, that's some of the things that we offer uh, in, in, with immigrants. That uh, program has grown a lot in the last um, three years especially. Um, our immigrant um, programming includes legal assistance. So I know, does anyone here offer legal assistance at your office? No? Okay. Do you get questions? Do here. You do, do here. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, there's been a real demand for legal immigration legal services, both because of an increased interest in applying for citizenship. A lot of people around the election, um, that always happens when there's an election, people get really excited and they want to vote. Um, and that interest in citizenship has continued. And there's also a lot of people who are unsure about their status. So for example, we work a lot with the Haitian immigrant community um, because um, a lot of our services are at Central and in um, Flatbush in Clarendon, which is near Flappish Junction. Um, and with the end of Haitian TPS, there's been a lot of questions. So we do um, free screening and consultation for anyone, regardless of their status. It's good for because there's often a lot of fraud in this area, and people go and pay someone to hear um, good news, um, but the news is not always good. So we, um, we're, we have free, trustworthy um, legal service providers that come in, um, they speak. Creole, Spanish, Russian, um, and Cantonese, and they're able to do free screenings. They can help people with their applications. Um, we also have ongoing info sessions for anyone who wants to learn about citizenship um, and understand the process. Um, we do a lot of things when I put together this um, one pager. I, can't, I don't wanna just list five million things for you. <laughs> if you go to our website, um, there, under outreach, you'll see some of the services that we offer. We love to partner um, with, with community organizations. Um, we'd love, I know a lot of times people come up to community board meetings and talk about some of the work that we're doing, but we'd also um, love to provide space to community groups um, who are doing work in the same areas that we are. Um, we have some contact information here on the back of how you can get a hold of us. Legal services, immigration legal services are by appointment. The phone number's there if someone wants to call and make an appointment. Uh, we also uh, have the number there if anyone wants to book a video visitation with a family member who's incarcerated. Uh, we have some classes um, that people can register for. For example, we have citizenship classes that people can sign up for, and we have creative aging programs. People can uh, learn an art form that are particularly for um, 50 plus, the 50 plus audience, but we have everything from flower arranging to 
jewelry making, dancing, uh, yeah, their tango classes are very popular. Um, and those are all over Brooklyn. They're also in multiple languages. Uh, we have a creative aging line that people can call there because we know some people just like to talk to someone on the phone that um, you can call and find out about the upcoming classes. Folks can register. Does anyone have questions? What are some of the opportunities that you have to partner outside of the library? So I know about the book mobile, are there other resources that we can partner with? In what sense do you mean partnering because we always we do part we partner with the faculty every year? Mm -hmm. For instance, every year in Bush we have an annual parade at Shape of Bush with event is focused on health. Mm -hmm. And we're looking right now for partners to join us. We always have our local library up and tabling. However, we would like to provide as much as possible at that event for the community which usually focuses on kids as well as seniors that day and the entire family. Mm -hmm. and so we put in a request for the bookmobile, but if there are other activities, for instance, that we can request, that's something that we would definitely do. Yeah, I know we partner with Shape Up Brooklyn to have classes in the library, um, but we would love to come and do um, programming as well. I know in North Brooklyn in particular, there are several libraries um, including Macon um, and Bedford that do healthy eating programs with children and they have um, East Flatbush is also doing a program um, in that area where they have books that connect to healthy eating. Um, we are actually right now developing a health initiative where we're hoping to bring on someone who focuses specifically on public health um, and we can make referrals to good trusted resources. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Information on the new library. Do you mean Sunset Park and yeah, Mike could answer that. Uh, what's happening at your library, your new library. And so for like Sunset Park, Brower Park, Brooklyn Heights, and Greenpoint, uh, and Central, uh, which are some of the bigger projects that are going on right now, um, all of that information is on the library tab. Uh, but yeah, so but if there's something in particular, I can get you the information too. Yeah, so that one has like the, um, uh, the renderings of the new library are on the page um, uh, of what the interior is gonna look like. Uh, or like, the, the layout of these, the actual finishes and stuff like that are still being decided. But um, uh, on, the, uh, on the Brooklyn Heights page, there is like the uh, full detail of like schedules and stuff like that for the new library. Uh, and that interim, there's like, it's talked about the interim library too. We have the latest Creative Aging flyer and some of our, our library lanes, our Brooklyn-wide bowling league, if you're competitive, <laughs> has a tournament every year um, on Thursday mornings all across Brooklyn. Um, people bowl using Xbox. We're getting really competitive. We also started a, a Brooklyn Robotics League for teens oh, to yeah. uh, build robots and compete against each other. Uh, there are like regional competitions throughout Brooklyn. Uh, We've used a lot of uh, community leaders as judges in this process. Uh, so if you're interested, I think we can connect you there too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another way to explain that leaf is just a program that go on in outreach services, but there's still over an array of different services that the library also still provides, like the business, uh, business and career library, where you get all your job readiness. Um, uh, details from and and then there's so many others that are adult learning center for especially for people uh, new Americans coming in that try to navigate their way around the system and and learn and learn a lot about language and stuff like that where we can help them there. Okay. Any other questions? We'll be here, so feel free to come stop by and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we had one more presentation, Josh Levin. He's the Director of Business Development uh, here at Borough Hall. He's running a little, little late.
So we'll go into our um, brainstorming session until Josh gets here. <laughs> and since we have um, DEP here, um, I know I posed a question about the public meeting. Is that something you all would be interested in, having a general public meeting in Brooklyn, since we have a representative here? Yes? <laughs> right. Because I, you know, she lists on the um, presentation, I think there was Staten Island and another borough, but we didn't see anything for Brooklyn, so. Okay. Right. So, Mikhail, we'll get back to you to let you know for sure if, okay. if that's something. Okay. Yeah, and um, you know, if we could work with you on um, location. Okay. Again, we, we've had a lot of meetings in Brooklyn throughout the development, so okay. you know, we're happy to come out for another. Sure. Okay. Good. So I, I, I would just like to add, and we spoke offline, but we would love the meeting. Um, to discuss how DEP is incorporating uh, the removal of illegal front yards mm -hmm. and curb cuts into the stormwater management program. Okay. This is an issue that we've faced for many, many years, many okay. decades. Okay. And we're just seeing it get worse, so we would like to initiate that conversation. Okay. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. I think Josh, are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, we just. I was just saying you were a little delayed. Okay. So again, this is Josh Levin, Director of Business Development at Brooklyn Borough Hall. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. My name is Josh Levin. As uh, my colleague Tanya said, I also handle parks policy. Uh, thanks for uh, hearing us ab uh, about the parks report that we put out uh, a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> we released the report at uh, Ridgewood Reservoir, uh, highlighting not only um, a great community asset, but a nationally historic register, a recently national historic register landmark. Uh, so at this uh, at this revealing, we talked about our Pulse of the Parks report, uh, which uh, the policy unit put together. Uh, I'll walk through a bit of the methodology. Since we're looking at uh, 270 parks, uh, I'm not going to go into every community district's detail, but get it at, a, at as an even play, play field as possible. So we're looking at uh, fresh water consumption, i.e. drinking fountains, uh, nonprofit partner, comfort stations, Wi-Fi, and um, uh, park uses. So we're looking more at the active parks rather than the passive parks where people are sort of st uh, sitting, relaxing, um, might just be like taking their lunch or taking their kids out. Um, so we're looking at 270 parks over a half of, uh, acre. Um, we looked at that size, like I said, because we were looking for those active parks. Um, and then we, we also wanted you know, we want to acknowledge these, par these smaller parks, but not in this report, so to speak. This is the key that we would, that we uh, use. Like I said, we're looking at everything from Prospect Park uh, down to like a Mc uh, McNair Park or a, a Mount Prospect Park. Uh, so we, we assigned the leaves uh, to signify, like I said, the methodology of drinking fountains, friends groups, programming, activities, comfort station, Wi-Fi. Some of the takeaways from that, uh, we found that 27% of the parks affiliated had a nonprofit partner. 89% um, had access to drinking fountains. And on that note, we're not talking about like whether the, the drinking fountains are working right now or not. We went to each park, ground truth them with a survey from Borough Hall staff as well as volunteers. Uh, but we were doing a visual analysis, not a nitty-gritty 
you know, since we were doing this in the spring, summer, and winter over a course of a year, we weren't looking at everything uh, to the functioning ability of things. 60% uh, of parks house a comfort station. Uh, a glaring thing we looked at was Wi-Fi accessibility, something that the borough president is very adamant about, connectivity to uh, uh, portable devices as well as laptops. And then 81% of parks had uh, one activity use within their borders. So these are some of the recommendations that we were uh, putting out there based on our assessment of the, uh, the, the, you know, the ground truth thing. Um, we, we really do believe in like the community engagement model that some of the friends of groups have really put together. It's uh, been a great partnership, uh, both with Partnership for Parks and New Yorkers for Parks and the Parks Department to put more um, emphasis into some of the uh, the maintenance and, and caretaking uh, that small friends of groups do, as well as larger ones. Um, so we're also, aside from advocating for a larger mo a model similar to the Open Space Alliance in, in Community District 1, um, we're just also going to be convening uh, parks advocates on a, on a quarterly basis and trying to connect those partners to available programming. The technology recommendation, something that we'd like to uh, explore with capital is expanding Wi-Fi access, um, possibly through reservoir funding. That's, that's a conversation we would want to have with the, uh, the, the Friends of Groups and, of course, Parks Department. Similarly to the fund, uh, um, another thing about funding matter is that during the uh, announcement, we called for 1% for parks. This was uh, something that was called for back in 2000. Uh, that would had uh, pegged the parks budget to 1% of the city annual city budget. Uh, so that would be a over $335 million increase or uh, $385 million increase in the parks budget uh, to help for more, pro, um, more partnership with parks staff uh, as well as capital improvements. And then of course land use recommendations. Um, you know, we have a, a large park system, but there are certain communities that don't have enough open space and green space, so we want to use the opportunity during our ULERP recommendations uh, when, when developments come online to push for more open space and green space. So any questions, I'm happy to take them, and then this is uh, the link to the, the report on our website. Um, so I'll open up the floor to anyone who might want to ask questions. Thanks. Yes. Good morning, Sean Campbell from Community Board 14. Um, you, you, um, was there any breakdown of, by Community Board of the number of parks? Actually, let me back up. Community Board 14 is 59 out of 59 community boards in terms of the number, uh, percentage of residents who live more than a quarter of a mile away from parks. So the fact that you were looking at parks that were half acre or more also misses the fact that of the, tiny, of the seven parks we do have in the district, some of them are really tiny. So when you look at land use issues, was there any recognition of the districts like ours that are parks poor um, and, and maybe some creative thinking about within Euler, but also we have a lot of public space, um, not a lot. We have some public space that could potentially become um, parks assets. So we broke it down by community district. We looked at those assessments of the five uh, factors and, and listing the, the number of parks within there and basing the averages of, of the, uh, or the percentages based on the number of parks. So while we didn't, like I said, while we didn't look at the much smaller half acre passive parks, we did note the, the more active parks and it's something that we will consider you know, moving forward with land use decisions. Okay, and then quickly, we, had, we were fortunate enough to have through the Fund for the City of New York a planning fellow this year who works specifically on parks issues, um, identifying space, looking where we have greater density and fewer parks, um, and I'd love to be able to share that information with you. We may have missed some opportunities for some mutually beneficial conversations, so maybe we can backtrack and have them. Of course. Yes, Commissioner Marr. You have something can I, to say? Can I have a copy? <laughs> of course you can. We sent it to your staff, but we'll we'll bring, we'll we'll print a copy for you. We want to make sure that you know you're you're partnering with us on these you know going forward. This isn't affecting, of course, this isn't affecting the capital conversation we're having right now. This is future capital conversations and, and an opportunity for parks advocates to drill down in the details that they might not be able to do on their own and advocate for their parks. Free, free money's off the Okay. 
Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate your time. So I know at the uh, February meeting, we had somewhat of a brainstorming session in terms of some things that you'd like to see, um, or people you'd like to see come to the meeting. Uh, tentatively, for the May meeting, we have the Do It Commissioner. I know that was um, something you all were interested in. And I'll probably know maybe within a week or so if that is, um, if that's definitive, but right now, the commissioner is scheduled to come um, at the May 22nd meeting. We also talked about um, having the utility companies attend the meeting. I know we have a representative from Con Ed here, and I'm not sure if I spoke with you on the phone. Um, I did speak to someone um, maybe a month or so ago, and before they wanted to come to the meeting, they asked that the district managers if they had specific questions so they're not coming here and then they'll have to go back and get answers to the questions. So if there's specific questions that you need answered, if you can get those questions to me so that they're very, you know, they're well prepared when they come to the meeting. I think that would be helpful. So if there are specific questions that you have, you know, we can entertain them at this time and then take them back so they're prepared when they come to the meeting. I, I, on that, could we, I mean, specific questions specific to our districts aren't going to be pertinent to everybody in the room. Mm -hmm. um, so are, are they looking for questions about their operations borough-wide? Mm -hmm. or, or my colleagues, should we try to focus on? I can clarify. I think business as usual is totally fine. If we take individual referrals from the district managers and, and leadership, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis where we have the right information, ticket numbers, and the, sort of the, the pedigree information that we've been using all this time. Let's just keep it the same way. I think it works well. We all have, uh, you know, our service territories, and we can handle each other, you know, each of the community boards the way that we do and have a you know, one-on-one -on -one relationship. Here, I don't know exactly, and pardon me if I got it wrong, but uh, yeah, I should say it now. Hello, uh, my name is Terrence <laughs> Kelly. Uh, I joined corporate affairs about two and a half months ago. I previously worked at Barclays Center at Varsity Radnor. And on this team here, uh, a lot of this, this similar sort of operational uh, aspects of the job are things that I wanted to help with in terms of troubleshooting on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and here, I think there's more just in terms of pattern of behavior. If there's something that the CVs have seen that makes sense to bring up here, that's where we're, we're happy to take a stab at know, uh, sort of a systems-wide look at things. Um, otherwise, you know, individual concerns and constituent issues, let's definitely handle it. We, you know, we track them in Salesforce, we can do it that way, business as usual. Um, but also, while I have the floor, I'll take 10 seconds to say hello uh, about the smart meter installations that we are doing in Brooklyn, they hit. Uh, and really, uh, the broad stroke of it is that advanced metering and infrastructure, the AMI, um, is the industry standard in the United States, and a lot of community boards have gotten this presentation already, um, if not in general, the, community, uh, the, 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 the committees. But we're starting in East Brooklyn, like in RC, East New York, uh, you know, and we're moving from the less dense neighborhoods from east to west. And the entire uh, installation project is, is over two years for just Brooklyn alone, and will complete citywide by 2022. Um, we're working with the police department and we're trying to hit up a lot of the police community council meetings as well to make sure from a public safety aspect that older adults and seniors and vulnerable populations don't, you know, get uh, introduced to new scams because you know new, new technology needs new scams. Um, so we're happy to also uh, use the forum to talk to us afterwards if there's uh, upcoming meetings, you know, or if you want us to come back here after the summer when it gets closer to when we're going to be in, in your communities. Uh, that's something we're happy to talk to you after this as well. Just, just to circle about that, that was very school, but I'm going to go back to, um, I think that one of the reasons yeah. why we wanted to talk to utilities, not just you, was that, if I recall correctly, we're, we're having worse and worse experiences on notifications. 
that's the case, that's a good uh, touch point right now, is that we, we introduced a work notice automated committee to, to really drill down where we are in terms of what our internal communications are looking like and when we, when we have work notice automation, uh, what we can do to improve the process because as you can imagine, you know, if we're averaging 6,000 permits a day citywide, uh, you, can, you can imagine that there's a lot more, uh, I wouldn't say discretion, but what, do you, what is what does, does the standard work for soil testing on a sidewalk that takes up one block of con one slab of concrete require a test versus you know taking up an emergency like you mentioned the other day? I think Anya called when we had an emergency permit issue over the phone by DOT to shut down street traffic next mm -hmm. to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of this is just better communication and informed decision making on our end that I think we can have a further future conversation about. But yes, yeah, work notice automation and, and communication and public information is something that is up top of mind with us and we want to continue that to make sure that you know that we're, we're dealing with that internally and hopefully have some better answers in the near future. But it's important. So maybe we want to have them come speak to us when the, the, their near future occurs rather than just being told that it's in the works. I'd be happy to do that. I mean, there's no promises on the table that we have anything better than what we're offering now. but. Listen, it's a work in progress. Yeah, we're here, right? So let's not let's not dismiss it and say we we know it's actively being worked in progress. So, but yes. All right. I wanted to just uh, mention. So I'm from National Grid. Um, so I'm not I know. So I'm uh, filling in for Renee's work. Um, but I didn't know that you guys wanted a meeting for utilities. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm Terry Yard from National Grid and Customer and Community, um, representing um, uh, Renee, because she's not here uh, today. But I did not know that you guys wanted a meeting, so um, definitely we'll take it back to the team. And I understand that there are some um, concerns regarding a lot of the work that we're doing. As you know, we're all over Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island. So uh, I know communication is one, because I know the community boards uh, send us information about the work that's going on. And similar to Con Ed, we do have you know, some system improvements that we're working on to get that information out to our stakeholders. Um, it is a work in progress, um, but we are trying and we're trying to improve the process. Um, so you can let me know when the next meeting is. I'll make sure um, that we have somebody from our construction team. We get a, a full team in. All right, thanks. Um, just a question for National Grid. Um, it seems, like you said, it's a communication part. Um, I had currently right now a resident since last Wednesday no notification you know 20, less than 20 less than 12 hours notification that they were going to close off the street they turned off the gas I tried um, to get her gas back on before the weekend called you called Renee uh, the, the machine doesn't work so I typed it in the computer it's um, being looked at as of yesterday they still haven't received gas and What's the address? Yeah, 3207 Mermaid Avenue. I think I have and, Yeah, and I do know I that you guys are looking at it, but the lady hasn't had hot water or heat for the last week now. And I'm sure they're not there today because she's somewhere in Manhattan, but you know, she'll be available tomorrow, but it's a whole week. And what do we say to them? I think she mentioned that she wanted it on um, Saturday. Uh, any day. Saturday. I mean, it was, you know, you know, you have no heat. I mean, th today is nice and warm, but right. last week when it was raining, those two or three days that were cold, she had to turn her electric heater on, and that doesn't heat up the whole house, you know? And, and then, not your fault, but Hale and whoever's putting the pipes are doing a, a shoddy work um, because she has uh, a spigot outside of her front yard, and they put the pipe right underneath it. So now they can't put any bucket underneath that spigot because the pipeline, common sense, you don't put it under there, but, but she doesn't know who to complain now to. Okay, so I think I yeah. got your email and we've, yeah, sent it I, out, yeah, and we've sent it out to our construction team for them to have the service turned back on. Um, but, can we connect after the meeting to just... Yeah, no, it? definitely. I mean, it, it's just more my concern because I asked her yesterday if it was turned on. She said no, it wasn't. And she knew she was going to be home today, so the next day would be Wednesday. So that's, like I said, it's a whole week already. So it's just a concern, you know, how do we... And also, the, the workmanship. When they come back, they done a lousy job, not you, but the hell, been doing a lousy job with the, the sidewalk. It's been cracked within a, a month's time, two months' time, and they're saying, oh, it's the salt that you put down. No, it's not the salt that we put down. 
you know, and they haven't responded. They haven't responded to that, and it's two years now. I mean, they've done my block two years ago without telling me two days before Thanksgiving, and I'm like, really? <laughs> and I'm on the community board, you know, so they didn't tell me, and it was just shocking. They just tore up the whole sidewalk, and that was it. It was just a concern, and it's still happening. We're still doing it now, you know, as we speak, you know, three or four blocks at a time on Saturdays and Sundays too, which is really crazy yeah, yeah, because we nice. were like, we know that you need to do it, but really on a oh, Saturday, yeah. Sunday, hey, you know, uh, Helen, uh, Helen, 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 Helen's the one. Hey, I think your Saturdays, I'll be yeah, yeah, right. yeah, but they do both days, you know, so it's not like they do one or the other, they do both days. And I think my friend is, I don't think you said Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. so yeah, I, I would say, you know, yeah, it's just, you know, I understand yeah. um, the complaints that come in. We, I get them because I'm CC'd on a lot of the complaints. Um, as you know, we are doing a, a lot of work, you know, and we are trying to work with Helen. We, we meet with Helen every month to go over some of the concerns that we have. Um, if we do come out on a Saturday and Sunday, we do have a permit to come out yeah. on those days. Uh, so. <laughs> they just do it. They just do it. You know, and that's, and, we you shouldn't know, be, but, um, but that's it. You know, I would say, you know, continue to send us that information. We, we continue to proactively work with Helen to mitigate some of these issues. Um, and if anybody has any issues, just please see me after the meeting and I'll, you know, definitely try to get that resolved. Just a quick question. Does National Grid go out to look at these sites when, when Helen's Yes, we do. We, have do you inspect we, it? we do have inspectors that go out. Um, we have a team of inspectors that go out and inspect Helen's work as well as our in-house work. Okay. Because I do see a lot of debris. They do leave a lot of mess on their office site. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Smith, we're going to have utilities here. Please have the contractors come yeah. for National Grid, particularly how. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And New York Paving. Yeah. Yes, all the, they should have their contractors here, Con Ed and National Grid contracts that they use for projects. And, and actually, another idea, I'm not sure if it's a good one, but I'll put it out there, is maybe um, Public Service Commission at the same time so we can talk about when things go awry with the accountability processes. Anything else? I know we have a May 22nd meeting and then we have one in June. So we're trying to um, solidify the calendar and the agenda for those two meetings. I just want to ask about the May 22nd meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so tentatively the DeWitt Commission is going to be here. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a good idea maybe we should submit our concerns and our requests before that. Sure. So. Uh, when it comes, you shouldn't like. Okay, I gotta go back right, and, right. and and and. Who's so coming May twenty seventh? Who's coming? The commission. Do it. Do it. Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, that's something that you all mentioned. I think at the February meeting that you yeah. wanted to see. Um, so I think maybe we should, you know, for Tanya some some of our concerns and requests. So when it comes to the meeting, he actually has yeah, some answers. answers. Barry, let's, let's will you start that off? Because you have a really good sort of synopsis of it all. Will you start it off and then we can add to what you put out? Yes. Put together? Okay. okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll put something together, email only. Mm -hmm. Does the, I see we have our Parks Commissioner <laughs> from Brooklyn, does he, does he have anything in report for us? Keep your box clean and we will The pools, uh, daffodils and tulips are blooming all over. If you have parks that don't have partner groups, we would love to work with you. The best parks always have partner groups and good community boards that you call on. Um, so we're happy to help with that, but we're ready to take on summer. Although it's, I've been here 34 years, so there's never a slow season anyway. So is there anything else that we can add to the agenda for possibly May and June? Well, if you think of something, let me know. Well, well right now, May is just do it, right? Right now. And if, I guess if we get the uh, utility companies with the um, contractors. We're going to aim for June for that. If we Are can do it May, I'm not sure if we'll be able to, but I'll try. OK. OK. Um, I think that also when we have the utility companies, we should have EOT here as well, because they're a big part of the process. Permitting, at least the permitting process. And I guess if you have specific questions there too, the same with um, do it. 
so they're not going back. <laughs> So I don't think we have any old business or new business. Um, if oh, go ahead, Laura. Sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'll email that out. Um, if Real everyone could make sure you sign in. If you, I know a few of you came in late. If you can sign the, the sign-in sheet before you go. I just want to know: Are we doing the meetings now on fourth Tuesdays of the month? Um, this actually calendar was given to us. No, no, I know. Yeah, but I just noticed that. Um, is that the new um, meeting schedule? Is it the it doesn't Tuesday? have to be. I'm not sure. When were you all meeting before? What was it? it was the second Tuesday. Tuesday. Is that better for you? Yeah. Second Tuesday? My meeting's on this Tuesday. Okay. 16, okay. a board meeting is tonight. Okay. Yeah, so that, the, the calendar was given to me, so I just kind of, but we can, we can go back. Um, are prefer. we in agreement that we yeah. want to go back to second Tuesdays? Okay. Starting May, is that um, when you were um, interested in? I don't know. Two weeks from now. Because that, yeah. No, that'll be two, two weeks, weeks from now. Then. Right. I don't want the commission to say hey. Right, because I mean, right, that may change the. I mean, we, we can finish out the fiscal year. Yeah. Okay. The way it is now, but then start back September. in September. September. Okay. 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 I think actually September 13th might be the second Tuesday when no, I'm looking at uh, the September calendar. September 11th is 9-11, uh, it's a Tuesday. Okay. Say that again? 9-11 is a Tuesday, um, in September. But it's the primary, it's the primary but yeah, it's Thursday. Uh, yeah. So it no, could be it was the, moved. The primary yeah, but, was moved. But no, but 9-11, the day of, is Rosh Hashanah. That's why they moved. Okay. <laughs> As well. Okay, so we can go back to second Tuesday, no problem. Just, yeah, starting the next fiscal yeah, year. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or? Go ahead. Okay. I'm make a brief announcement, Jay Gottlieb from OMB. Look forward to seeing you all here You're back in speaking of September for the uh, community board borough consultations. And please, God, tomorrow I will be sending out the memo to all the different boroughs to ask for a borough coordinator to be selected. And I look forward to finding out who's going to get this wonderful job in Brooklyn this year. And then we'll have a meeting uh, at OMB in June to get going on the agenda. So we'll have a really productive Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.